Aloha, welcome to the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum webinar called Eyewitness to History. Today we will hear about the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941 from a child's perspective and we'll learn how to use the oral histories to document family experiences from World War II or to document your own experiences from what we're experiencing today. You will have your chance to be an eyewitness to history. We are so fortunate to have two talented authors with us today. We have Jennifer Swanson. She's an author with over 40, uh, more than 40 STEM books, and is the one that's most important to us today, the American Girl book called Pearl Harbor, Real Stories from My Time. We also have Dorinda Nicholson with us today, and she's the author of Pearl Harbor Child, and she's also the author and inspiration for the American Girl doll in series called Nanea. So, and you also see some other people in the windows. We have educators from the museum. We have Ashley. Ashley's going to share an educational resource with us at the end of the show that describes how all of you at home can collect oral histories. We have Eric on the question and answer, and we have Ford on the chat. So please add your questions for our special guests to the question and answer, and please add your comments to our chat during the program. In our last webinar, we had quite a few attendees from all over the world, so we love to know where people are coming from. So please consider adding, adding your home country to our chat, just so we know where you are coming from. And most importantly, when you're thinking about questions and comments for our chat, please remember to be thoughtful and kind with your comments and questions. Okay, so, all right, we're gonna go ahead and get started, and I'm gonna give you a little background on the attack on Pearl Harbor. So I'm gonna share my screen now. So welcome to the Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. This museum is located in three World War II buildings on Ford Island in the middle of Pearl Harbor and is America's first aviation battlefield. Right here is where World War II began for the United States. Here is the same, this next picture shows the same hangar that you saw in the last picture, but this picture was taken on the morning of the attack on Pearl Harbor. <coughs> On the grounds of our museum and in the surrounding waters, high-level bombers, dive bombers, torpedo bombers, and fighters from the Imperial Japanese Navy mounted their attack on that peaceful December morning in 1941. In this picture here, you can see the Japanese uh, bombers coming in and to an attack on this island here is Ford Island. Our museum is located in this area over here. This next picture shows the attacking force and the death and destruction that left in its wake. The first bombs that fell crippled the American air defenses and decimated our fleet. The US was stunned and unprepared. It was a dark day for the entire country. So this is a, talking about a military attack is not an easy one. So we're so grateful to have Jennifer and Dorinda here to talk about their experiences and share a little bit about what it's like to be an eyewitness to history or how to record those histories for us to remember. So first we're gonna have Jennifer Swanson here and she's going, she is the author of the American Girl book called uh, Pearl Harbor and uh, Real Stories from My Time. And she's gonna share a little bit from that for us. So Jennifer, take it away. Thanks, Monica. So uh, I am honored to be here as a part of this podcast to talk about one of the most momentous events in history, in American history. Um, and it was a thrill for me to be able to write about this because um, Monica and I are actually classmates from the United States Naval Academy. So we know a little bit about Naval history. Um, and so I was thrilled when American Girl and Scholastic approached me and asked me to speak about um, Pearl Harbor. So I'm going to read for, let's see, start my video. Okay, there we go. I don't know what happened there. Sorry about, Sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I'm going to read just a little bit about um, from my book to kind of set the scene, so to speak, which is what we authors get to do. Um, and then what I'm going to do is um, kind of answer why I wrote this book. Um, 
So the beginning of this, or I'm just gonna start in the middle of it here. Um, just before 8 a.m., 183 Japanese planes descended upon Pearl Harbor. They bombed U.S. fighter planes that sat unattended on the airfields. They dropped bombs on the ships docked in an area called Battleship Row. The USS West Virginia sank and the USS Oklahoma exploded and rolled over, trapping hundreds of men inside. The USS Arizona took a direct hit to its ammunition compartment, which set off a massive explosion. The ship broke in two and sank in less than 15 minutes, taking more than 1,100 sailors with it to their deaths. When the attack was over, just before 10 a.m., more than 21 U.S. Navy ships and 75% of the planes on the ground were damaged or destroyed. The surprise attack killed almost 2,400 people. Civilians, or people who are not in the military, were affected as well. More than 60 of them were killed. The attack was felt all around the island. 17-year-old Keiko Nakata was working in her parents' taro patch out in Kahalu'u, a small farming community. Even though she was far away from Pearl Harbor, she heard the sounds of gunfire. She thought it was a drill until a bomb dropped into the neighbor's yard. Children all over the island were huddled together with their families, wondering what was happening. They listened in fear as the plane zoomed overhead. They cringed as earth-shattering explosions ripped through the air. Some even watched in horror as gigantic fireballs surged high into the sky. In less than two hours, the lives of all the people in Hawaii were drastically changed in ways they could never have imagined. So this is my great honor to write this book. And, and I think if you're an author or what we're asking all of you to do is, is collect history, this is what you need to do. Find something that you're passionate about. Um, now, why did I write this? Well, I am a nonfiction author and we actually get our jobs one of two ways. One way, we come up with an idea and, and submit it and send it out, which is what you might be used to. But sometimes the uh, publisher comes up with an idea and they look for an author. And in this case, um, Scholastic and American Girl were looking for an author, so I had to try out for this. You know how you have to try out for your sporting events sometimes, or you have to try out for a music, a musical instrument or something like that? I had to try out um, for, for this piece. I had to write a piece um, about World War II, and then the editors picked me to be able to write this book. Um, so, but I was really thrilled, as I said, to be able to write about Pearl Harbor. Also, coincidentally, uh, while I live in Jacksonville, Florida, we had just visited Pearl Harbor at the time, and I've been able to see this and feel the emotion of this place. So, again, it was, it was a dream to be able to write this book. Well, thank you, Jennifer, for sharing your story, and also, um, talking about something that's traumatic for some children, but also talking a little bit about what it's like to be an author and to, um, how you get these stories. So next I'm gonna invite Jorinda back into the room. All right, welcome again, Dorinda. So now Dorinda, if you remember, she's a child that had um, actually lived through this terrible time in our history. And she spent her lifetime, so um, up until now, making sure that, that the child's perspective of this attack on Pearl Harbor was heard. So I just wanna say thank you to you, Dorinda, for sharing all these stories with us and also for being with us here today. So um, for, so thank you, Dorinda. Well, mahalo, I'm, I'm glad to be here and aloha everybody. So I wanna share my screen again, so you'll still be able to see Dorinda, um, but I wanna share some pictures that Dorinda shared with me and also um, a map so you can see where she was living at the time of the attack. So Dorinda, this is a picture that I received from you and it shows a pic you and where you were living. Can you tell us a little about your experience on that day? 
can you uh you see the circle mm -hmm. so that was our house and the reason we found ourselves there as civilians because mom uh mom's hawaiian and uh had always lived in the islands but we ended up moving to the peninsula surrounded on three sides by the waters of pearl harbor because if you look just left of the circle you see that lock l-o-c-h pan american world airways if you came to hawaii from anywhere in the world and you wanted to fly you had to come on a sea clipper took hours and hours and hours and land there that's where mom worked and that's how we ended up with a front row seat so look at where my house is and then you see just across the channel you see fort island and a wonderful runway for our airplanes to practice their takeoffs and landings you see the ships as they were placed uh, on that morning and i was used to this and i would take my bicycle and my dog and i'd ride down to the end of the peninsula and i'd go uh crabbing mostly because crabs are really plentiful there and i put my crab nets down and then i could just look across and i could see those ships that were there the utah which was the first one right where that uh arrow is first one to go down that morning and usually our aircraft carriers were are to be there uh december 7th 1941 wasn't supposed to happen so our aircraft carriers luckily were gone uh helping out uh, with supplies to the philippines but i could look across and see airplanes come and go see ships come and go so the morning of sunday 7 30 ish mom's in the kitchen getting breakfast and we hear airplanes going over well look where i live of course you hear airplanes going over but then our house started to shake and and dad i heard explosions came into the kitchen and said and this is what hundreds probably thousands of the men uh in these ships were saying boy those practices seem so real this morning sunday morning they don't usually practice and then there was an explosion we could not ignore so my dad goes out the front screen door and i'm right there with him and we look up in the sky and we can see bombers now i'm six years old i can't tell you oh that's from japan those see that's torpedo but what i can tell you just barely above our tree house the house top and barely above the tops of the trees i could see the pilots you could they wear goggles and they were leaning out because they were in their final descent and look where those ships are and the utah as i said their first one because gosh they wanted our aircraft carriers my dad comes back in grabs my baby brother out of his crib puts us into our black 1939 ford sedan we go up the peninsula as you can see and keep going up the peninsula and above that area keep going right there all up in there those are all sugarcane fields so my dad guides our car into the sugarcane field and he tries and tries to switch the knob on our car radio what kind of information what's happening to us we don't really know except we look down and you can see mile high black black huge clouds and every once in a while um red sparking through that but what is going on and then the broadcast says this is a radio announcer and his name was webley edwards we still love to listen to him every sunday morning and he would say this is the real mccoy old-fashioned language for this is not an air raid drill 
all military report to your bases. Medical get to the nearest hospital to treat the wounded and injured. The rest of you stay in your house. Do not use the phone. It's for emergencies only. And then he goes off the air. You can't stay on the air. What if there's Japanese up there trying to get radio signals? So goes off the air. The, the rest of, you can see, we're civilians who live in the middle of the harbor. So they are all leaving and we're all hiding in the sugarcane fields. And then that afternoon, Dorinda, can I show the viewers your, um, the, your family and your car? You shared some pictures with me, and I want to show our viewers. This is the picture of your family. It is. Oh, there's my baby brother. There's my Hawaiian mom. My dad's from Missouri, so that's where I live now because I came for college, and I met this really, really cute guy. So um, that's my Missouri connection. But my mother and my brother... Uh, stayed in the islands mm -hmm. and this is our front yard um you know i i could walk to the harbor and then putting our car into the cane fields those of you in hawaii know that sugar cane and you have to be careful when you because we were running in and out of it and you'll get cuts all over you those of you uh not familiar could recognize it as corn uh it looks very, very, very similar. So we're in that car, twisting that radio dial in the afternoon. And mm -hmm. the governor comes on and tells us again, mm -hmm. this is the real McCoy, stay home military, get to your bases, medical, get to the hospitals. Now the rest of you do not leave your house. And he declares martial law. That means it's not our friendly officer friendly anymore. It is a military person who is now going to direct us. I wanted to go home. I'd left my dog. I really thought we'd turn around and come back home, but not so because of martial law. And then I showed you where I lived. Mm -hmm. So military police come in to gather all of us and we can't go home. There's live ammunition <laughs> and that area has to be cleared. So they take us close by to a sugar plantation. One of the last actually to operate uh, in the islands called Waipahu. And the people there gave us the recreation hall and provided pillows and blankets and food for us uh, to sleep on the floor. And that's where we stayed for our first night. And I'm often asked, weren't you scared? Aren't you scared? That's when I was scared. Mm -hmm. Let me tell you why. You get all your neighbors and friends and families and you're all together. Martial law, no lights on at night, anywhere in the islands and certainly there. And then people start to say, I bet our water is going to be poisoned. Oh, I bet they're sending in paratroopers right now. I bet when we wake up, we're going to be surrounded. And then along about nine o'clock, we saw what looked to be like another attack at Pearl Harbor. And the adults around us were saying the Japanese have come back. Dorinda, you have 50 years to find out differently. And at some point, I can share that. Well, I want to show, um, share with our viewers a page that you shared with me from your book that talks about this time. So this is the, a page from your book when you went through that evacuation. So yes, that's the, that's the um, traditional smokestack that you see at all uh, the sugar plantations. So, you know, I wish I'd had a, a camera so I could have taken pictures of all of this. Well, you, instead of pictures, though, you do have some artifacts and some of these, um, you have pictures and you have artifacts. So this is some of the things that I, I know that you told me about. So if you want to tell our viewers about the things that you have that um, are, uh, remind you of that time. 
the head of the bullet that you see uh, upper left, my dad dug out of our kitchen wall. In our kitchen, uh, these must have been incendiary bullets uh, meant to set things on fire because all through our kitchen there were these dark uh, streaks. And so my dad saw a bulge just above our phone and he took his pocket knife and pulled this out. And my mother carried it uh, all her life and, and now I have it. And then what I wanted you to see was, look, there was a time that Hawaii, the United States had wartime currency. In fact, when I go to schools, and if they don't know the Pearl Harbor child is coming, uh, this is what I start off with. I'll say, when I was your age, I wore a gas mask on my playground at school were bomb shelters. My, I had wartime currency in my pocket. Um, I couldn't leave my house at night. I couldn't turn on the lights. I had no school. Um, couldn't use the phone. What country am I from? And nobody, nobody says the United States. This kids that you're listening, this is your history. And even if you live in Hawaii, you don't know it because it's too recent for you. So that's why today you're going to hear from Jen, you're gonna hear from Ashley how we want you to record the time you're in. This is kind of your Pearl Harbor moment. Oh, check out the gas mask. My brother, when he took it off, uh, that carrying case was almost half the size uh, of him. And on my uh, book cover, I have a picture of me uh, holding my gas mask, and I always ask kids, um, what do you think is in that bag? No one ever guessed, oh, of course, it's your gas mask. It says United States government, child gas mask. And uh, they think it's a book bag. And then I can't help but thinking, kids, that, that you're listening today, you're wearing a mask of sorts. You're not in school. I was not in school. So again, you're going to be hearing collect stories, collect yours to begin with. You had to take those everywhere. And that uh, photo, you, uh, when you go to visit Pearl Harbor, uh, there's a life size of that. So when you go to visit, I want a selfie of you in front of that, that right. I want your selfie in front of that photo. You might not recognize me, but I want a selfie of you, okay? Because right. I want you to go to Pearl Harbor. I want you to feel that history. I want you to walk where it took place. So Dorinda, so, you have more stories to tell us, and I know that there, um, you were kind of alluding to this earlier, but uh, we talked a little bit about the day of the attack, but you said that there was some differences um, that you didn't learn about until later. So can you tell us a little bit about uh, this, this picture here and what was happening? The differences that I didn't know um, have to do with uh, a number that Jen quoted, that there were 60 civilians, um, that these, like this picture here, what you are looking at, we thought was a Japanese shell. No. This is a Hawaii family who lives up near the University of Hawaii, near Waikiki. This is friendly fire. This is an American shell. And the picture you're looking at, that's the youngest casualty of World War II, December 7th. She was only two years old in her crib. And uh, the sad results of, of friendly fire. And I love the definition that one fifth grader gave me because I always say, do you know what friendly fire is? And I always, yes, yes, yes. And the definition said, friendly fire is when you hit your friends, you hit a uh, family, you hit all those on your side, you don't mean to, 
but it always happens and it does. So that figure, friendly fire, the smoke and, and the attack that I saw sitting in the dark in the distance from Waipahu, we all thought, oh my gosh, the Japanese are coming back. Friendly fire. We shot down six of our uh, pilots, American pilots off the USS Enterprise, who were trying to find the Japanese aircraft carriers, which had long since left. Mm -hmm. The 60 civilians, again, we do not like to talk about friendly fire. It's such a sad part of war. Mm -hmm. I hate to tell you, but that number represents friendly fire. And I've interviewed Japanese pilots from that day, and we were not targets. But surprise attack, our uh, guns are locked up, and we have to get all this. And when we get our guns manned, and we get the shells up in the air, and we miss these hundreds of airplanes, look where the shells come down. And then part of the 60 that I'm so happy to talk about were Honolulu firemen, first responders. And so the, that's part of the civilians. The rest, friendly fire, and one was a little girl uh, in my neighborhood, friendly fire. Well, thank you for sharing that with us, Dorinda. That's probably something people don't know about, but I think it really shows about how time can be confusing. Um, it can be confusing when things like this happen and uh, when you don't have all the information available to you. You don't, and I, you know, tonight um, when the news will come on, there'll be another story on uh, the corona, uh, and we will start writing now, but these historic events do take some distance and some more research and those always continue to develop. Right. What you see on my front porch, first of all you see my dad's name and then under it you see Hale, that means house, Momi means pearl. My mother's nickname was po Momi and because we lived in Pearl Harbor, she named her hula studio Hale Momi. So you see the name uh, of our hula studio and then our house number and then go to the porch. That was our doorstop. When we had to stay away about a week and before we could come back home, um, anything that was still live ammunition had to be removed. So we went around collecting uh, what was no longer dangerous. And so uh, some of you kids have seen bullets and you've made like whistles out of them. Those were everywhere. And then this big shell. Doesn't everybody use a December 7th shell for a doorstop? Somebody must have recognized it because when we moved um, the Navy took, a, took our house away from us and we moved to above Pearl Harbor and somebody stole it. Shouldn't have used it for a doorstop outdoors. Uh, hard to believe that. Now, now I know, um, Dorinda, you have a message that you want to make sure all of our viewers have about um, you being an eyewitness to history. Can you share that with us? I can, and Kaloha is my nephew. If you're listening, hi. Auntie loves you. Um, this is a message to all you kids. Go to Pearl Harbor, learn the history while you're there. And in today's climate, I do have a message I want to leave you with. And I put them in an ABC. A, spread aloha, not corona. Do what you're told during this time. B, all of you who are pen pals with me for American Girl Nanea, this is your homework. And you're supposed to find out what the B is. Be a sponge. Sponge, I want you to absorb 
and learn about yourself, about this climate, what's going on, what your teachers are sharing with you. I hear a lot of you have tons of homework and you thought you were gonna get away, didn't you? And then C, collect your stories, collect your family stories. World War II happened so long ago, those of you still lucky enough to have those with World War II history, write that down. And a lot of it is right in your family. And then interview your mom and dad, how I wished, you know, my mom and dad would tell me stories and I go, oh, I've already heard that. Oh my gosh, I wish I'd asked sooner and I wish I had recorded them, take a recorder, take their pictures, video them. And I'm gonna say aloha, ahoy ho, which means until we meet again. And then listen to what uh, Jen has to share with you and what cute Ashley has to share with you. And aloha. Thank you so much, Dorinda. Mm -hmm. Yes, so next, you're right. Ashley, one of our museum educators, has prepared some resources for our viewers. And that'll help to understand how you can best collect your oral histories. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it on to Ashley. Welcome, Ashley. Hi. Uh, thank you, Monica. All right. So I'm going to share my screen in a minute. But I just want to say hello to everybody and welcome. My name is Ashley, and I'm going to go over a few activities that we created for our student viewers and our online visitors that go hand in hand with today's webinar. Um, before I begin, though, I, I just want to explain a title that I'll be using today for our guest, one of our guest speakers. Um, growing up in Hawaii, I was always taught to respect my elders. Um, so we're going to do that here today, and I will be referring to uh, Ms. Dorinda today as Auntie Dorinda. Um, it is a sign of respect that we use here in uh, the islands, even if we're not related. So just wanted to go over that before we started. Okay, so... Now on to our activities. I'm gonna share my screen here. So, uh, we've heard a lot of historical information from Auntie Dorinda today. Uh, the act of her simply telling us her own story from her point of view is called oral history. Uh, we have been extremely fortunate to hear her story directly from her. It, it really is an honor. Um, and this is the value that we are highlighting in these activities. Um, we know it's a tough time for everyone right now, and we feel stuck inside, uh, but we think that this is an unexpectedly perfect opportunity to collect oral histories, just like Auntie Dorinda said. We really encourage you to do this. Um, we want you to document your lives right now, how you're feeling, what you're doing to pass the time, all of the little details, they all matter. So we've made prompts for every age level to practice and learn about oral history right at home. And all of these worksheets uh, that I'm gonna show you right now are available to download on our website. They're already up, so you can go look for them. Uh, the first thing I'm gonna show you is uh, two informational sheets. The first one defines oral history. You see that right here. Uh, it just gives you a brief overview of oral history and what it is. Uh, and then we're gonna move on to a guide to oral history. This is kid-friendly and you don't need any uh, previous experience collecting oral history. This is a step-by-step -step guide that's going to help you with the entire process. Okay, now we'll uh, go into the other resources that we have for the kids. So this is very in-depth for you guys to look through. Here we go. Now we're going to start with um, our preschoolers. So a lot of us uh, always skip our preschoolers, but as, uh, Auntie Dorinda has made very uh, obvious and has uh, that she proved um, a child's perspective is really important. Um, my own grandmother, uh, she lived here in Hawaii and she was four years old during the bombing of Pearl Harbor. And she remembers everything very vividly. Um, so it's important to include the little ones as well. They have a lot to say. Um, so we have a little challenge here, a 30-day challenge that every day uh, with the help of a parent or an adult, you fill out how you're feeling today, the weather, what they did, what they even ate. Um, you just go through it with them every single day and we'll, you can 
watch them progress over time, how they've recorded that themselves. Um, as we go on, every activity uh, includes more grade levels. Um, this one right here is a daily journal. Uh, they just track for themselves and draw a little picture of what they have been doing. Uh, this one right here is a, uh, a prompt, a reading prompt, to, you can read about one of our planes found at our museum, the Swamp Ghost. It is an oral history. And students will be uh, creating their own follow-up questions to uh, basically ask the speaker in this interview. They can start thinking about how to record oral histories and create their own questions. Uh, this one right here for our middle schoolers, they will be going through a whole bunch of biographies, mini biographies, and read about these individuals. And at the end, they'll be picking the best candidate to interview based on the information that they have and explain why, um, and then come up with 15 questions to, uh, to ask this person. Now, finally, we have our older students. Um, and they can use all of the resources uh, online and available. And what we want them to do is to conduct an oral history, collect a full oral history uh, with a person of their own choosing. Uh, but we really want to hit home that we'd like to get them to find a person who lived through World War II, probably between 1940 and 1947, and really record their stories from that time. Um, but yeah, this, these are all of our, uh, our resources that are available online to download. And we're gonna uh, bring back in uh, Miss Jennifer and she's gonna explain a little bit more about the interview process. Um, so I'm gonna invite Miss Jennifer back. Hello again. Hello. All right. So I'm gonna turn it over to you and stop my screen share. There we go. There we go. Uh, so I think we can all agree that listening to Dorinda give her story in person is just very, very moving. Um, I know it was for me and I researched about her and read all of her stories and her books, but I think hearing it for the first time in person just really affected me. And, and this is what you do um, as an author. If you're going to be the person collecting the histories, then there's a couple of things that that I do, and let me see if I can share my screen here, um, because Ashley gave you guys a fantastic um, way, step-by-step, step, how to do this. Um, so here is what I say. You, you have a list of everything you do. How do you actually conduct the interview if you're gonna do an interview? Now you can do it easily and you can just have a conversation with people and that works well. Um, but in my job, I have actually, I interview scientists and engineers and experts all over the world. And these people are all really important and have really important jobs. So I want to make sure that when I approach them, I'm not wasting their time and I get what I need. So the first thing that you should do if you're going to approach someone to do, a, you know, an interview and even for a living history interview is do your own research. You should know a lot about what happened that day in Pearl Harbor. Not just what you heard here, which is amazing, but you should also do some of your own research. Um, that'll give you a whole big knowledge base. And when you're talking to them, you'll feel more knowledgeable and be able to follow the conversation. Um, it also is just kind of a respectful thing to do, to, to maybe research that particular person. Um, like I said, I will do, um, I've done interviews with astronauts and I will look up their careers and what they did when that, they were on the International Space Station so I can ask them, you know, intelligent questions. So once you do your re research and you're ready to ask someone, um, you can, if they're in your family, clearly you're going to go up and just, you know, have a conversation with them. But I, I think if you want to do an interview, you should maybe be just a little bit more professional about it instead of saying like, hey, mom or dad, can we have a chat? How about, I would like to interview you. Kind of, you know, put on your reporter hat and be a little more professional. That kind of brings it up to a higher level. Um, if perhaps you want to do an interview with someone in your family or an expert who maybe doesn't live near you, the best thing to do, particularly right now, is send an email. 
okay? You're gonna send them an email and ask them if you can interview them. Now, in your email, you need to be, again, professional. Um, so actually, if you guys wanna take a picture, I'm gonna stop sharing so you can see a little bit more of me. There you go. Um, but I think what you wanna do is, I always use the title. So I'll say, um, Dear Dr. Helmuth, or Dear Dr. Smith, or whoever I'm speaking to. Why? It's just polite, especially if I don't know them. I mean, you know, if you're going to be talking to someone, you could say, dear grandma, dear Auntie Dorinda, um, something like that. And then you say, I would like to conduct an interview with you or, you know, use your own words. I'd like to have an interview with you and then tell them what you want to interview them about. Um, I want to talk to you about anything you would have experienced if you lived through World War II or what happened on the island afterwards. And so they know exactly what you're interested in. Um, and then if you're at a distance, then you're gonna have to conduct your interview on the phone or video. So make sure you give them a couple of times that you are available and ask them if they are available. Um, don't just say, hey, the only day I have is Tuesday next week between 12 and one, that has to work for you. Okay. That that's not really good. Plus, <laughs> you never know what their schedule is. So ask them for a time and then you, you can connect and go back and forth. Then the third thing is prepare for the interview. So just like Ashley showed you in the book, you should have questions. Now, I don't know about 15. I don't usually have 15 questions ready. Sometimes I do. Um, but come up with questions that you're going to ask them and then send them to them to the person before, because then they'll know what they're going to have to talk about. And this actually, believe it or not, they might be a little nervous talking to you about what they experienced and what they lived through. So there's two reasons. One, to make them feel better about it. And two, to maybe make them recall and really think about some great stories that they could tell you. Um, so that just gives them an idea. Now, you don't have to only ask those questions as you're having your conversation. Other questions might come up, but this is a good starting place. And, you know, the one thing you want to do when you're thinking about your questions. Now, I write nonfiction, so everything in what I write is tr absolutely true. But you, when you're writing a story, you have to kind of pick a a path for the story to be told. Now, I am not saying that you change history. I am not saying you only ask questions a certain way. I'm just saying you kind of have to have an idea in your head of what you're looking for, for the type of story that you want to tell. Um, and those will help you with the questions. So as you prepare for the interview, you need to think of a quiet spot. So if you're here, like for example, on this podcast, you know, I put my dogs in the back room, everything's quiet right? So I could, uh, inter or I could tape this video if I want. Um, same goes if you're doing a phone conversation. Um, the other thing you should always have with you is a pen or pencil and a piece of paper. And I realize that you might be videoing this or, you know, taping this on your phone, but also take notes. Um, why do I say that? Well, I learned the hard way one time. Um, I was taking notes, but I had, it had taken me two months to track down a researcher in China who was working with pandas for this book that I was working on. And we, it was because I live in Florida and he was in China. It was difficult to find time to get together. We finally had a phone call and got together. Um, and I had an app on my phone because there's apps you can download on your phone and it'll tape your conversations. And I had used this before absolutely no problem. I just turn on the app, I push it on speakerphone, and then we just have a conversation and it's worked great. That time I decided to put in my headphones instead of listening on the speakerphone. Unfortunately, after this very long and fruitful hour and a half long interview, I went the next day to listen to this and realized that because I used my headphones, the only voice that I recorded was my own. That was not good. Okay. <laughs> so then what do you do? Call and arrange again? It was very embarrassing for me to do that. So that's why I'm saying take notes and check your video and your audio. The other tip, um, it is 
illegal to tape people on a phone without their permission. So here's a trick. When you call them, if you're going to do a phone interview and tape it, you call them, you get them on the phone, you greet them. Hi, how are you? Okay. And then you say, are you ready to tape? And then you push the app to start the app. Once you start recording, then you say this. Hello, this is Jennifer Swanson. I am here recording an interview with Dr. Smith. Dr. Smith, do I have your permission to tape you? And he or she will say, yes, right there. You have that on your permission, okay? It's part of your phone and part of your recording. So A, you'll know if you ever go back to your recordings, you forget which one it is. You'll hear that at the beginning, so you'll know it's your, your interview with Dr. Smith, but you have permission taped. So make sure you do that. Okay, so then step four, time for the interview. Um, you know, it should be an easy conversation. Just like Monica was just talking to Auntie Dorinda. You see how, how Auntie Dorinda just talked and then occasionally Monica would insert something and maybe push her towards, a, or I shouldn't say push, guide her towards a question or a slide that she knew Dorinda wanted to show. That was a great example of how to interview people. Because the key when you're interviewing someone is to listen way more than you talk. Your job is to listen. Um, it is to ask the questions. So you'll have your piece of paper in front of you with all of your questions. Um, and you'll, but ask, after you ask your question, you let the person talk and you just hear. And then if you're paying attention to the conversation, sometimes you'll, you'll get more questions. Like they'll say something in, you know, for example, where Auntie Durimda was talking about a certain place in Hawaii, you might be like, oh, excuse me, could you tell me where that is? And then you'll make the note. So it's an easy conversation. Um, those are the best ones. That's what makes everybody feel comfortable. Now they don't, sometimes your interviews are not comfortable. And that's just how it works. Some people are very awkward when they're interviewed and they feel very stilted. Um, but just make it as easy as you can. And if you show interest in what they're saying, then they will respond. Um, the last part is thank them. So when they're done, when you're done speaking with them, thank them. You know, tell them, this was great. I learned so much. And I think it was really interesting to hear all about what you did. Now, for me, if I conduct my interviews on the phone or not in person, I will actually, or sometimes if they're in person, I will send them emails, the scientists and the engineers emails, and I'll say, thank you so much for your time. Um, for me, if they're going to appear in one of my books, I also offer them a free gift of one of my books because they, they're credited in my book. You don't necessarily have to do that or you don't have to give them a gift, but thank them. And the other thing is, if you are looking for more people to interview, ask them. They might know of somebody else that could lead you to somebody else that you could interview and another person that you could interview and so forth. Um, and that has worked really well for me in the past. Um, so uh, one time, I, a book that I did for, called Astronaut Aquanaut, I needed to find a bunch of astronauts and a bunch of aquanauts. And the only person I could find was one aquanaut at Northeastern University. But I happened to ask him and he all of a sudden introduced me to this aquanaut and this aquanaut and this aquanaut and that astronaut. And it made my life so much easier because he was able to connect me with all these people and tell them, hey, come talk to this author. So if that's what you're trying to do, which is get a whole big network and talk to a lot of people, you can do that within your family. Maybe you talk to your mom, your dad, your aunt, your uncle, your grandparents, your cousins, and just see who all you can do. And then everybody might have a different point of view. And if you end up writing a story about this, that will give you so much richer depth to your story. Um, so anyway, I'm going to leave you with this one tip. When you interview people, have fun and learn. Um, for me, the best part about being a nonfiction author is learning all of these amazing stories that people have to share, just like Auntie Dorinda. Oh, thank you so much, Jennifer. It's uh, so inspiring. And I'm hoping that it inspired our viewers to write some of their oral histories or collect it on video and 
I'm encouraging them to please share that with us. Then you have my email, monica.sanjose at pearlharboraviationmuseum.org. So if you want to give it a try, please share it. And we'd love to see that. Now, I want you guys to know that uh, we did get some questions for you while um, you've been talking and sharing with us. So I want to go ahead and answer a few of the questions from our viewers. So the uh, first one goes to Dorinda. So Dorinda from Josephine, she said that she heard uh, when you were telling your story that your kitchen was on fire and she was wondering how much damage was done to your house. Not very much. Um, the incendiary bombs made black streaks, but uh, the only thing that caught on fire was parts of our roof. Hmm. All right, so thank you for that. And then we have a couple here um, from Amanda, and this one is also for you, Dorinda. They were, she was asking how old your dog was when this happened, and what happened to Hula Girl? Oh, I, I love, 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 love Hula Girl. You know, I'm not sure. I, I got her when she was a puppy. She must have been a couple of years old by that time. But when she was a little puppy, uh, my mother, I showed you that that's, we had hula lessons in our house. So from the time she was little, she followed me everywhere. She followed me into hula class. She could wiggle too, so I named her Hula Girl. And um, I wanted so much to get back to her that day, and we couldn't. So I was away from her for almost a week. And when we came back, let me tell you, the car was coming down the road. I'm hanging out the window, yelling for no hula girl. So I got up into the mango tree, no hula girl. I looked under the house, no hula girl. I got on my bicycle, finally found her that night and I was frantic. I kneel down to say my evening prayers and I thought I heard her. So I looked under the bed, of course she wasn't under the bed, but she had to be under the house part of under the bed. And you know how when you sign a light on an animal, sometimes their eyes go green. And so my dad and I went out under the house and there she was. And we had a, oh gosh, a, a kissy, sloppy, sloppy uh, reconnection. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> now, um, there's another question um, that asked about uh, this time that you experienced. So uh, when you became older and when you think back onto this experience, Dorinda, are you, do you still get scared about it? I don't. Um, I, you know, I think we all accept what our childhood is and you know, to me, didn't everybody get bombed in their front yard and it's no big deal until I find out later that, you know, if you are on Maui, of course, another Hawaiian island, or even on another side of the island, you might have seen some black smoke. Um, I just realized then, never really scared, but the obligation to tell our stories and that I, I had a story to tell. Mm. And, and I'm glad that you want to be witnesses to history. So I, I mahalo for coming today. Well, thank you, Dorinda. Um, I have a couple of more questions. This one's a, a personal one for you. And um, because your story really matched the story of one of our viewers, um, they, they were asking whether or not you lived one of their, near one of their family members when you experienced this. And the name was Auntie Kaui Brant's house. So did you live near? Kaui Brant? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh, yes. I, I, whoever you are, I, I love your mom. And um, this is such an amazing person. She was hired by Disney to open Disneyland and then was taken to Disney World and she only died two months ago. Uh, my mother taught her, was her first hula teacher, and she walked two miles, one mile each way to come to hula. Yes, yes. Uh, she lived Pearl City Upper and I lived Pearl City Lower and I loved Jeanette Mahikoa, which is 
um, she became later known as Auntie Cowley. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Great to hear that connection. <laughs> Well, I think we are a little bit over our time, so I want to make sure that we give each one of you a chance to have one final message and also answer a question for both of you. A lot of people are asking where they can find your books. So we know that, Jennifer, you have a lot of STEM-related books, and Dorinda, you have the Pearl Harbor Child book, but also some other things. So, um, Jennifer, if you could start just one final message to our viewers and also let them know where we can find their, your books. Um, go out and write histories, find history. Um, so you can find me at my website, jenniferswansonbooks.com. I have uh, STEM books, but I also do have a book about World War II. It's mostly about for middle graders and up, and it's on the European theater. Um, but thank you for having me. It's been wonderful. Thank you. And Dorinda. Hey, Dorinda, question. this is oh, what my book looks like. And you know, I, don't I have the same hair? Do straight, short, uh, and there's Hula Girl. Um, I have a website that's just my name, Dorinda, D-O-R-I-N-D-A, Nicholson, N-I-C-H-O-L-S-O-N dot com. Uh, also Pearl Harbor Child dot com. Either of those uh, would reach me and, and uh, other books on World War II, mostly on Pearl Harbor. All right. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer and Dorinda, for sharing with us today. And for everyone else, if you didn't get to see the whole program, we're going to put this on our YouTube channel so you can go in, in a couple of days and you can find that on our museum website, which is Pearl Harbor Aviation Museum. So just want to say thank you and aloha. Aloha, aloha everybody.